Glad to see you, and there's never a bad time to worship the Lord, is there? Amen. Let's stand and make, put our voices together in praise to him this morning. This morning. Why don't you go ahead and be seated? We welcome you to chapel today. This is the beginning of our biblical interpretation conference today and tomorrow for all of our, um, our ministry studies students. This is uh, required, and your classes, you don't attend classes, you intend this conference today and tomorrow. For those of you outside of the major field of ministry studies, you can attend the conference every session and your absences out of your classes are excused. And so we hope that you'll participate in this. This is, as I'll be introducing our speaker here in just a few moments, an incredible opportunity for you to be equipped and developed 
in the area of biblical interpretation with one of the most uh, accomplished scholars in the field in Southern Baptist life in recent years. And so we're excited that he's here and the opportunity to hear from him. Preview day is this Friday here on campus, so we will be having lots of activities on campus and prospective students here March the 10th. We're praying today from the IMB. We're asking God to bless the theological education endeavors in Tanzania. I've actually been a part of those and taught on two occasions there. And uh, God is doing a tremendous work in Tanzania, or Tanzania as they like to call it. And then for the Turks of Istanbul in uh, Turkey, we want to be lifting them to the Lord in prayer today. So. This is an opportunity for you to learn about broader theological issues. The theme of the conference this year is reading the Bible with the early church, how church tradition helps us understand the Trinity better. And our sessions will be taking place today and tomorrow in here during the chapel hour. And the other sessions will be in Solomon Hall, room number one. I do want to introduce our speaker today. He's really not a stranger at all to the Baptist College of Florida. In fact, he is a 2004 proud graduate of the Baptist College of Florida, and this is a bit of a homecoming for him, Dr. David Rathiel. Of course, he is the, the son of our own, Dr. Mark Rathiel, and we are thrilled to have him here, as well as his parents, and his grandpa is in the house today as well. So. Uh, we're blessed. Let's welcome them today, would you? They're with us. Dr. Rayfield is the director of the Academic Graduate Studies Program and associate professor of Christian Theology at Gateway Seminary in Ontario, Canada. He's the author of Baptist and the Emerging Church Movement uh, from 2004. He's also written chapters in the miscellaneous companion and Baptist gospel and culture. Uh, he's referred, he's had journal articles published in uh, the Journal of Reformed Theology and Baptist Quarterly. He's preached in numerous churches where he has served now for uh, 10 years as an ordained pastor. He did his uh, BA here in 2004 his MDiv and his THM at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. He did his PhD at the University of St. Andrews. He co-chairs the evangelicalism in the long 18th century consultation for the ETS, for Evangelical Theological Society. And he is an associate fellow of the Higher Education Academy. And so uh, he's preached not only in many chur churches, but he's presented conference papers at the University of Cambridge, the University of St. Andrews, the University of Edinburgh, and the Edinburgh Dogmatics Conference. And so we are greatly honored and blessed to have our dear brother here today. And so looking forward to hearing from him. After we have our music, we'll be able to hear from him. I will tell you that Dr. Rayfield is also married to April, and they have one daughter, Sophia. So really excited to hear from him today. So Father, we worship you, we bless you, we give you glory and praise today. We hail the power of Jesus' name. We thank you that in the name of Jesus, you can be saved, that you can be transformed, and that uh, every knee will bow. And we thank you for this opportunity today for, to hear from our brother. Thank you that he's devoted his life to position himself to be able to equip and inspire and educate young ministers of the gospel. And we pray that you'd use him to do that today especially. We pray for the endeavors in Tanzania. We pray for the Turks there in Istanbul and around Turkey. We pray for a mighty revival here on this campus and even spreading to the ends of the earth. In Jesus' name, amen.
all for coming this morning. Thank you, Dr. Clore, for the invitation. I appreciate that. Thank you, Gateway faculty and administration, for your encouragement and support. It is wonderful to come home, and it's wonderful to come home here. As you heard, I'm a proud graduate of this institution in 2004. I have great fond memories of this place. As I was sitting here in chapel, I was remembering back to whenever I was an undergraduate student here. And uh, this place has provided me so many special opportunities for ministry for ministry training, and I wish and pray God's blessings on Baptist College of Florida. I'm happy to represent BCF wherever I go. I've heard great things about your leadership. I'm thankful that you're here. I also want to give special honor to my father and my mother and my grandfather who are here, as you heard. I live on the other side of the country, and I don't get to see them often, and so I appreciate the chance not just to give a lecture, but to be connected with family again. My father was my first theology professor. I was taking his classes probably in the same room that you're taking his classes in here. And so uh, I enjoyed the work, and I survived the work, and you can too. And so he is a wonderful professor, a wonderful man of God. Thank God for my mother who taught me theology at the home, and thank God for my grandfather who always modeled Christian life and Christian living well. I'm excited for what we can do together over the next few days. I'm excited for the conversations. I know that some of the sessions might be required for you, but I do hope and pray that you find them enjoyable and helpful for your ministry context. I also want to say that I bring you greetings from Gateway Seminary. Uh, Gateway Seminary is located in Ontario, but if I can make just one slight correction, uh, I am thankful that we are not in Ontario, Canada. Uh, we are in Ontario, California, uh, because Canada is uh, quite cold to me. And so uh, we live in Ontario, California, which is named after Ontario, Canada, but has much better weather than Ontario, Canada. Uh, Gateway Seminary is located about 15 miles from downtown Los Angeles. We're on the eastern side of LA. I say 15 miles because quite frankly, uh, that means that with traffic, that could be an hour or an hour and a half in Los Angeles. And that is no exaggeration. Uh, but Gateway is strategically located in the West, in California, uh, we're a seminary that's committed to missional activity and missional work. And if you'll permit me to put a quick plug in here, uh, if you're interested in talking about Gateway, I'm very interested in talking with you about Gateway. We offer MDiv, DMIN, THM, and PhD degrees. And le needless to say, because we are in Los Angeles, we are not in the Bible Belt. And so if you're interested in ministry training in a context that is radically different from the Bible Belt, then Gateway might be for you. Uh, I teach my classes uh, in the evenings most of the time, and we have people from a multi uh, multitude of ethnic groups and people groups represented. I, as a Caucasian man, am the minority in my classes. And so every night I'm teaching Korean students, Chinese students, students from Hong Kong, Taiwan, who've all moved to California, been converted, and now are receiving ministry training. 
It's a wonderful, special environment. And a lot of people come to Gateway because the multiculturalism that is in L.A., the wide representation of people groups that is found in L.A. allows for people to kind of prepare well to go overseas on the mission field. And so that's Gateway in a nutshell. That's why I've committed my life there to Southern California. Well, that's enough with introductions, I hope. I look forward to getting to know you over our sessions together. This morning, I want to kind of give a teaser, an introduction of what we will be talking about on this afternoon and tomorrow. We're going to be talking about tradition and how tradition can shape our theological work. In particular, how tradition shapes how we should preach and teach and understand the Trinity. Now, whenever I was growing up uh, as a young man, before I received education at BCF or at other schools, I must confess that to me, the Trinity was kind of an abstract, scary, mysterious doctrine. I knew that we were supposed to affirm the doctrine of the Trinity, but I had little knowledge over what sort of practical relevance it actually had. It was something at times I was even afraid to discuss because I was afraid I would get it wrong. And it seemed if no matter what I said, despite my best efforts, there was always some sort of heresy that I was inadvertently falling into. It's such a complex issue. But I hope by the end of our sessions together, you see that the Trinity, the doctrine of the Trinity is actually the heart of the Christian life. And the gospel message itself has an explicitly Trinitarian shape and form to it. To confess the gospel is implicitly and even at times explicitly to confess God as Trinity. And so I want this to relate to how we understand God, but also how we do our ministry work. Now, to get to these conversations about Trinitarianism, we want to pull from the great wisdom of the Christians who've come before us. And that's why we're going to talk about tradition. And when we talk about tradition, we can put on the screen, uh, that word tradition conveys a lot of different images in people's minds. Uh, some of you, when I say tradition, you might think of, say, your church context and the traditions that were unique to your particular church, the hymns that they sang, the way they took up the Lord's Supper, the style of preaching. And when I say tradition, as important as our local church context are, I don't refer to what we grew up with in church. I'm referring here to the broader Christian fellowship, the communion of the saints that precedes us by almost 2,000 years and the great wisdom and the great knowledge that we inherit by being part of God's global universal church. Other people hear the word tradition and they might think of some sort of harsh legalism. When I was a student here, there was a song that was popular by the Christian band Big Daddy Weave, which is just a fun band name to say. Let's just be honest, had to work that in. And the lyrics said, uh, I want to go with Father God in the fields of grace. And they said, if we do that, that's the place where religion dies. And I remember singing that with youth groups. And as soon as that line where religion goes to die was sung, everyone started to scream and shout. And the implication was, well, religion and ritual and tradition is bad. It's constraining. It keeps us away from grace. We want to leave these things and go into freedom and the grace of God. When I say tradition, I'm not talking about a straitjacket that prevents us from the truth of the gospel. I'm talking about a correct way to read the Bible that we've inherited, again, from gospel-believing people who've come before us. And so it adds richness and depth to our theology and our understanding of grace. It doesn't have to destroy our understanding of grace. Now, there's a lot to be said about tradition, a lot more, but I will just at least say this as well. When I'm talking about tradition here, I'm talking about the inherited wisdom of the Catholic Church in sense of lowercase c, which just means universal, doesn't mean Roman Catholic. So the universal church of God. And I'm talking about using that wisdom, that inherited wisdom for theological construction. How we build our statements that we make about God, the Bible, and the church. Now, as soon as I say that, Perhaps red flags go off in everyone's minds. Because the initial response is, well, that sounds more like Anglicanism or Roman Catholicism. That doesn't sound like Baptist or Protestants. What about the Protestant doctrine of sola scriptura, the Bible alone? 
Surely the Bible is sufficient. We don't need tradition. We don't need these other voices. We just need the Bible. But now don't mishear me. I am a convictional Protestant. I'm a convictional Baptist. I believe in sola scriptura. I believe the Bible is sufficient. But Luther and Calvin and the Protestant tradition also said, while we hold to sola scriptura, we also hold to the value of tradition. And so I'm, as a good Protestant, saying for good theology to move forward, constructive theology to move forward, we need Bible, but we also need humility. A humility that recognizes we're not the first people to read this book. There are people who've come before us who've read this book. They're pious. They're devoted to the Lord. They're committed to the gospel. And they've left for us their reflections. And humility means as I read the Bible, I want to read it in community. Not just with my church community who's living, but the church community who's dead. The church community who's gone before me. That's what we mean by tradition and theology. And we desperately need to do this process in contemporary evangelicalism. So if we can put up on the screen uh, the next picture, please. This is a picture of Jaipur, India. And I went to Jaipur, India in 2005, soon after I graduated from Baptist College of Florida. And in Jaipur, I was on a mission trip for two weeks ministering to, to Muslims and to Buddhists. Uh, who are a minority group in India. And we were taken on one night to a place that was the equivalent of the Indian Disney World. It was a resort in Jaipur. And it was supposed to show you what India was like years ago. And so you had classic Indian food. You had the chance to ride elephants. All of the stereotypes you might have well, they were there. They were showing you kind of rural Indian life. So we sat down on the floor in the dirt to have this classic Indian cuisine, and they brought for us two cups. We had been out all day doing ministry. We were so thirsty. And so instantly, as soon as the cups were placed before us, we looked inside. There was water inside. We grabbed them. We started to drink. As soon as we started to drink, I noticed two things. Number one, the water was... Uh, <clears throat> Sandy. It's gritty. <laughs> and number two, everyone else in that restaurant who was not in our American group, who was not Caucasian from North America, kind of looked over their shoulder at us like this, suspiciously. And I said, something's happened, and we don't know what it is. Well, that night, everyone on our team was horrendously sick. The name of the place, the name of the resort was Choki Donnie. And I'll spare you the gruesome details, I'll just say this. Suffice it to say, in our group, Choki Donnie became a code word for having to use the restroom. We were horribly sick. We found out later that that water was never meant for drinking. It was an ancient ritual of purification. It was not filtered, it wasn't chlorinated, it wasn't clean at all. Now, we had no idea because we're not in that context. We're living in our American bubble. We're used to how we do things in our country. Had we known, we wouldn't have drank. And we only wish we would have known, right? If only someone would have told us, hey, by the way, this is not how you do it. Now, I bring this story of Jaipur up, and you see the picture of the, of the beautiful city there behind me. Because this is how I feel about tradition and evangelicalism. The church has professed certain things about God in his inner life, his triune life. And God in his gospel, how God is the triune God, works outside of himself to bring creation and redemption. And what we have to notice and what we have to be humble enough to admit is that what we often say in our circles is not always in accord with, it doesn't always match up with how the church universal has talked about the triune God. And I'll show you some examples in a little bit. And so it's sort of a choky Donnie principle, if you'll permit me to say that. If everyone else knows something, but you don't, do you wanna know? If you live in your bubble and your context and everyone else knows, they're in on the inner circle, they know these things, would you wanna know? And so our time together for the next sessions 
will be simply me showing you how tradition works in theology, how sometimes we don't always talk about the Trinity in correct ways. What does the church universal say about the triune God? And then how can we learn from this tradition, this deposit that's been left for us? Let me just show you a few examples. On the, on the next slide, we have a picture of the Nicene Creed. And it's unfortunately small print. And so I'll read it for you, and that's on me because I've obviously used a smaller font. But the Nicene Creed is a statement of classical Trinitarianism. Those of you who are in church history or theology, you're probably familiar with this, or you're talking about it now. It was codified in 325 AD and then developed later in 381 at Constantinople. And so 325, the statement of 325, and the adaptations in 381, when they're put together, are known as the Nicene Creed. This is the statement of classical Trinitarianism that's accepted by Eastern Orthodox, Roman Catholics, John Calvin, Martin Luther, numerous Protestant denominations. And whatever it means to be Trinitarian, this is kind of it. You can think of it this way. The term Trinitarian is already taken. Whatever Trinity means in, in the church's life, it refers back to these developments in the fourth century. And so if we disagree with these developments from the fourth century, we may be right or we may be wrong, but at least we're not doing Trinitarian theology as the church defined it and as the broader church communion. Numerous Protestant denominations have defined it. Now on the screen, and I know it's small, but if you look carefully, <laughs> you can see that while we won't unpack this creed in all of its length now, you can at least see that there's language of fromness in the creed. This is what it says. It talks about God. It says, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, all things visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice the language of fromness here. The only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. And we'll talk all about this, you know, in our next sessions. Just for now, notice this language of fromness. The Son is from His Father. But He's from His Father not in the way that He was ever created, because He's eternally God. He's from His Father not in the way that it's temporal, in the sense that the Father said, you are not, and now you are. But eternally, he's in a relation of fromness, of sonship from the Father. Later on, the creed says this, I believe in the Spirit, the giver of life, who proceeds from Father and Son. So the Spirit is also in a relationship of fromness within God's life, within the Trinity. He's from Father and Son. Now again, we're going to talk about all of this. This is just kind of an appetizer. But if we could go to the next slide, I just want to show you this. Remember I said that what we say is sometimes different. And do we want to know? And so I'm just going to go through, in our next few minutes here, popular expressions of Trinitarian theology in modern evangelicalism. I'm going to hold those expressions up to what you just saw in the Nicene Creed. So our first example comes from a textbook you might all know. <laughs> and it's Wayne Grudem's textbook. Now, let me preface this by saying, I have used this textbook in my classes. This is not a bad book by any means. I have used this textbook when I taught as an adjunct professor here. So do not take this as any sort of slam or saying, Grudem is like bad, please. But if you look in the first edition of Grudem's textbook, he explicitly in the appendix denies the fromness of the Son from the Father. This is a doctrine called eternal generation in the Nicene Creed. Grudem explicitly denies eternal generation. And then later, in subsequent books, he's kind of revised his stance and changed his position, retooled his Trinitarian theology. And in the second edition, the newest edition of the book, he says, I was wrong. The Nicene Creed was correct. I now affirm that the Son is eternally from the Father. I affirm eternal generation. But then, while saying that, he retools it again. 
And he still says something different from Nicene Trinitarianism. And my point is simply this, not in any way to be provocative, but our standard kind of evangelical textbook, again, is saying something different about Trinitarian thought than all of the Protestant Christian communions have said. And it's saying something different than fourth century Trinitarianism. Now, lest you think that I'm trying to be provocative, I sat down for coffee with the person who's um, over Grudem at the school where he now teaches in a city called Rancho Cucamonga, which I mention only because that's an incredibly fun name to say. <laughs> California has some great place names. And I said, look, I never mention um, his name. I always want to be respectful and constructive and charitable. I never want to be provocative but I disagree with his Trinitarian theology. And the man looked at me and he said, well, I do too. Use his name, you have my permission. I said, okay, so it came from on high, okay. <laughs> so let's use another example. That's a common theology book. Our next is a common philosophy book that's used in evangelical schools. This is a, a book by William Lane Craig and J.P. Moreland uh, called Philosophical Foundations for Christian Worldview. This is a passage that comes from the back of the book. The doctrine of eternal generation and the procession of the spirit is a relic of Logos Christology, which finds virtually no warrant in the biblical text and introduces a subordinationism into the Godhead, which anyone who affirms the full deity of Christ will find troubling. What they're saying here is classical Trinitarianism, fourth century Nicene Trinitarianism, that Protestants have held to, Catholics have held to, Christian communions have held to is troubling, wrong, false. Now, at the end of our two days together, you may end up agreeing with these people. You may reject Nicene Trinitarianism. Or you may accept Nicene Trinitarianism. My point is, do you at least want to know it? Do you at least want to know how we're different from all of those who came before us? Because this book is intentionally, and Grudem's book is intentionally placing itself outside of the tradition. It's saying we know what the tradition says, but we disagree, and we're going our own way. I don't want to be, again, too dramatic, but I remember once, whenever I was overseas, and we were in a room with conservative Anglicans, Presbyterians, and Baptists, none, none of which were you know, operating and ministering in America. And word had come down that Grudem's second edition of his textbook had just been revised. He was finally starting to affirm elements of the Nicene Creed. I told you he still retools some things in perhaps problematic ways, but he was finally starting to affirm eternal generation. And the people in that fellowship said, well, thank God, we can now have fellowship with Brother Wayne. <laughs> now, here's why I tell that story. For us, this is a standard evangelical book. For them. Baptists, Presbyterians, Lutherans, Evangelicals, Conservatives committed to inerrancy because they knew the tradition, because they were so wedded to Nicene Trinitarianism, they thought he was the outsider. They thought he was the liberal because he wasn't in line with classical Trinitarianism. That's the discordant situation we're in. And so we are in an evangelical bubble, and I mean that in no condescending way. I am an evangelical, right? I am a Baptist. I'm just saying we want the humility to know what's outside of our context sometimes. How others have done it before us. Do we at least want to know? And I will, I'll close with this thought. None of what I'm saying here is irrelevant or abstract, although it might at first seem to be. Think of it this way. The Nicene Creed, when it says the Son is eternally from the Father, He's generated from the Father, that creedal statement wasn't the result of ignoring the Bible and people going on theological flights of fancy and, and abstraction away from the Bible. It was the result of years and years and years of patient, direct meditation on the Scripture's teaching. It was a desire to explain in a succinct way what the Bible really says. And because this is a teaching that emerges from the Bible, it's a teaching directly related to the gospel. In John 15, 9, the son says that the father eternally loves him as the father's eternal son. 
in John 17, 22. The son says, the father eternally gives the son glory. And this is related to the gospel because in John 15, 9, Jesus then says, the eternal love that the father has eternally for me, he now has with and for you. The redemption that's found in our union with Christ and adoption with Christ. In John 17, 22, he says, yes, I received glory eternally from my father, but now I pray that you may behold that and see that as my disciples. And so this is not abstract, disconnected from the gospel. This is connected directly to God's saving work in Christ. Remember I told you that Trinitarianism gives the gospel a Trinitarian shape and form? If we get the Trinity wrong, then we don't have the richness of the gospel correct. And so that's why I've kind of embarked on this journey in having these conversations. And so as we close out, I want to say a, a brief prayer for, for our time together in the next upcoming sessions. But you can see the schedule. Um, at 11, we're going to talk about how do we actually use tradition in theology? How do we do it in a way that respects the authority and sufficiency of God's word? Then after that, we'll talk about how did the early church read the Bible? Because to be honest, this is a question about hermeneutics. We don't see what they saw in the Bible because we don't read the Bible the same way they did. And so we'll talk about how did the early church read the Bible to find doctrines like eternal generation, the son eternally from the father. And then we'll talk at the last session today about just what is classical Trinitarianism. How has the church universal, Protestant, early church defined Trinitarianism? And then Tuesday morning, we'll continue that because there's a lot to say, and it's fun, let's be honest, it's a lot of fun. And then, then the chapel sermon Tuesday, I'm gonna close with a sermon, and I'm just gonna preach a gospel message and try to show how the gospel does have a Trinitarian shape. So I wanna close on a really practical note, how you can take this home in your ministry context, and hopefully enrich your ministry, your teaching, your preaching, your evangelism. And so that's the outline of, of where we're going. But uh, as I said, let me, let me pray for us before we transition. Father, we thank you. We're here today to love you, to love you with our minds, to think deeply about you. We're here today to love one another in the Christian community that we have. And that Christian community extends beyond just us in this room. It extends beyond just our individual churches. It extends throughout all time. All of the Christians who've lived before us, because you're a, not the God of the dead, you're the God of the living. And though they are passed from this life, they still speak. And we will one day be in communion with them in heaven, with all the saints. And so help us to have the humility to learn and to grow and to speak correctly about you and the richness and glory of your gospel and your divine life. Let all of this be done to praise to you. We pray this in your name. Amen.